Okay, so that's just gone. I think that's just gone 10. Perfect. Um, so yeah, morning everybody. Thank you for, for joining us for our session. So my name is Opash and I'm on the marketing team here at Bridgel. I uh, just wanted to say a quick thank you for joining us this morning for our webinar all around safeguarding your organisation with Microsoft 365 security. Um, just a quick note before we get started. So the session is being recorded and we'll be sending a copy out of this recording after the event. So if there is anything that you wanted to catch up on or if there's someone that couldn't actually make the session and then um, you want to, to kind of share it with them, you can do that. Um, you are on mute, but we do encourage you to use the chat function to ask any questions and we'll do our best to answer them throughout the session. We also have a dedicated Q&A at the end of the session as well. So we just encourage you to get your questions in regarding Microsoft security and we'll do our best to kind of answer them throughout the session and at the end as well. So um, that's the few points kind of covered um, just at the beginning. So what I'll do now is I'm going to pass you on to our team led by our Head of Cloud and Support Services, Ken Wilcox. We also have our experts, Craig Spears and David Sutherland on hand as well that will be guiding you through the session. So I'm going to pass you over to Ken just now and uh, we hope you find it, we hope you enjoy the session and find it useful. Thank you very much. Thanks, Opash. Thanks for the intro. Good morning, everyone. My name is Ken Wilcox. I'm Head of Cloud Services and Support at Bridgewell. I have over 30 years experience in IT and for the past 10 years I've been a consultant here at Bridgewell where I've been working closely with our clients on the digital transformation and implementation of public cloud services. On our agenda today, we'll start with a brief look at the current cybersecurity landscape. And then we'll look at discussing the, the Cyber Essential Scheme and what this covers and links to the uh, Microsoft Cloud Security Framework. We'll delve, delve into the features of M365 that will help self-guard us against cyber attacks. And then we'll have a look at what subscriptions you'll need and to access the tools that we're, we're looking at today. And lastly, we'll cover off some customer projects that, that we've delivered recently. For anyone who's new to Bridgewell, I'll start with a quick overview of who we are. We're based in Glasgow City Centre. At the moment, we've got 44 staff and that number is growing with several vacancies available just now. We were established in 2002 and are celebrating our 20th year, uh, 20th anniversary this year. Bridgewell advise, implement and support technology solutions to help improve businesses. We have four key business areas. The modern intelligent workplace team focus on improving employee productivity and satisfaction. Our business area, managed IT services and support, covers security, infrastructure and cloud services. And the data analytics and applications team who develop and support large scale bespoke custom software solutions. And we also have Trevi. This is a suite of product solutions focused on the water utility sector. We're a Microsoft solutions partner. And we've achieved 10 goal competencies through our project experience, staff certifications and sales performance as a CSP. We operate an integrated management system based on ISO 9001 and 27001 certifications, and we have Cyber Essentials Plus. This slide shows a selection of our customers across both public and private sectors. We work across a number of industry verticals, such as manufacturing, housing, national government, NHS, utilities and events. So moving on, let's take a look at the, the current cybersecurity landscape. There's no getting away from the fact that cybercrime is on the rise. Cyber attacks are getting more intelligent, varied and in some cases AI powered. I'm sure we've all had messages on our phone or emails impersonating major brands, providing updates on delivery of parcels we've never ordered. These messages are much more convincing and real looking nowadays. Most of us will know someone who's had their mail account compromised with hackers gaining access to their emails. Microsoft recently reported they recorded a whopping 579 passwords attacks every second. That's 18 billion every year. Hackers don't break in, they log in. 
all services have moved to the, all, as services have moved to the cloud this has created a huge opportunity for cyber criminals but please don't be too worried my colleagues craig and david aim to cover off ways you can protect against these threats later in the presentation we have on this slide two high profile cyber attacks that occurred over the recent years both arnold clark and sepa being hit on christmas eve Arnold Clark taking customer details with pen and paper to continue their business. No business is safe from cyber threats, but many continue to make common cybersecurity mistakes that leave them vulnerable to attack. One of the biggest and most common cybersecurity mistakes is denial. Many small and medium businesses read about attacks on larger firms but do not think hackers will be interested in their business. When in fact, over 43% of all data breaches involve small and medium enterprises. There are many common cyber threats and no business is, is exempt from them. And hackers are not picky when it comes to who they target. Software updates prevent hackers from exploiting weak entry points for your organization. But updates also improve your experience and ensure your software is as, is as efficient as possible. And the vast majority of all security breaches come down to human error. So it's the responsibility of all businesses to educate their employees on common cyber threats. If your employees are not aware of the dangers, you increase the risk of cyber attack, no matter how robust your awareness is or the security software is. Weak passwords are a common way for outsiders to access your business. Protecting business data and re reducing cybersecurity risks requires a strong password policy. And a critical factor in reducing cyber risk is to have a cybersecurity policy. However, most businesses don't have one. A cybersecurity policy ensures everyone is on the same page. It sets out the standard for cyber behavior within the business. You can't presume all your employees have the same idea for creating strong passwords or securely accessing data. A policy can help identify threats and ex explain employee responsibilities for protecting business data. Trusting public Wi-Fi can lead to your data being stolen or hacked. You can't guarantee the connection is secure. It is easy to join a fake network accidentally or for a hacker to launch an attack. You should insist on using a VPN in public Wi-Fi settings. Many businesses make the common mistake of skimping on security software. Pick a reliable software provider that you can adequately protect your business. You want software that quickly picks up and breaches and can take action. A centralized management system is ideal for access and analytics and understanding of systems. and they're not protecting your data. There are simple steps that you can take to protect data, but many, many businesses skip them. These include data backups, encryption, secure, secure disposal of the data, the monitoring of endpoints and personal devices used, and the current controlling of cloud services. And then lastly, we can look at access control, the use of use, use the principle of least privilege. Assigning one person to be responsible for your IT network or managing it yourself is one of the top common cybersecurity mistakes. The most secure way to protect your business is get support from qualified IT professionals. Cybercrime is on the rise. The COVID-19 pandemic has shown a significant rise in cybercrime and this unfortunate trend looks like it's here to stay. Around four in 10 businesses and three in 10 charities report having some kind of breach or attack in the last 12 months. Larger businesses are more likely to identify breaches or attacks than the smaller ones. And the top three attacked industries in 2022 were the education sector, government and healthcare. 
Even with cybercrime being so prevalent, just over half of businesses in the UK have acted in the past 12 months to identify cybersecurity risks. A few of the main cybersecurity threats are shown here, although there are many more. Phishing is a form of social engineering trying to exploit human error to harvest credentials or spread malware. They are by far the most frequent attacks amounting to over 80% of all breaches identified in the last 12 months. And they're also considered to be the most disruptive. Attacks can attempt to steal your money, your identity, and they trick people into revealing sensitive information such as credit card numbers or passwords. They're typically done through email, social media, or malicious websites. Malware is a blanket term for any kind of computer software with a malicious intent. Malware can, can allow unauthorized access, use of system resources, steal passwords, or lock you out of your computer systems. And ransomware is a type of malware which prevents you from accessing your systems and the data stored, usually by encrypting your files. A criminal group will then demand ransom in exchange for decryption or well, the attackers may also threaten to leak the data that they steal. Let's now take a look at some common types of cyber vulnerabilities. It's important to realize that security vulnerabilities are within your control and not the cyber criminal. Companies can proactively address and manage these vulnerabilities by taking the appropriate action and employing the proper tools, processes and procedures. Proactive prevention is always preferred over required remediation. Misconfigurations are the single largest threat to both cloud and application security. Because many of these services require manual configuration, the process could be rife with errors and take a considerable amount of time to manage and update. And then outdated and unpatched software again. The software vendors periodically release application updates to add new features and functionalities or patch known security vulnerabilities. Unpatched or outdated software often may make for an easy target for the cyber criminals. And to help address these issues, organizations should develop and implement a process for, prior, for prioritizing software updates and patching and try to automate this activity so far as possible. Weak or stolen user credentials. Many users fail to create unique and strong passwords for each of their accounts. Reusing or recycling passwords and user IDs creates another potential avenue for, of exploitation. Companies often grant employees more access permissions needed to perform their job functions. This increases identity based threats in the event of a data breach. Organizations should implement the principle of least privilege. This is considered to be one of the most effective practices for strengthening the organization's security posture. And then lastly, a misunderstanding of the shared responsibility model. Cloud networks adhere to what is known as the, secure, as the shared responsibility model. This means that much of the underlying infrastructure is secured by the cloud service provider. However, you, the customer, are responsible for everything else. And this may include the operating system, the applications installed and the data. Unfortunately, this can be misunderstood and leading to the assumption that cloud workloads are fully protected by the cloud provider with the organizations unknowingly running workloads in public cloud that are not fully protected. I'd like to hand over to my colleague Craig now, who'll run you through the next section of this presentation. OK, my name is Craig Spears. Uh, I work in Ken's team. I've uh, worked with clients over the years in their security solutions and cloud solutions. And uh, between myself and David, we'll be discussing the, the most common security risks and how we, how Microsoft tools can prevent them from happening. So in this slide, Cyber Essentials, I'll be discussing what is Cyber Essentials and how the Microsoft tool set can assist with this. Firstly, what is Cyber Essentials? 
Cyber Central is an effective government-backed scheme that was created by the National Cyber Security Centre to help protect businesses from the most common cyber attacks. This practice can stop up to 80% of these attacks. Also, it has been reported recently that some businesses are unaware of this government-backed scheme. And more commonly, we are finding this is a requirement if you're looking to obtain cyber insurance for your business. The Cyber Central's assessment covers five technical controls, which are firewalls and internet gateways, secure configuration, user access control, malware protection, and patch management. The control firewalls and internet gateways applies to every business where employees have access to the internet. Some of the required controls include ensuring firewalls are configured correctly, default admin passwords are changed, and having documented business cases on which firewall ports are open and which are closed. Secure configurations focus on employees' workstations, which includes all company mobile phones and personal phones if they're used for work purposes. Some of these controls are using operating systems that are not end of life, removing unused software from devices, confirming default passwords are changed, and implementing USB device and auto policies. Any new device out of the box will have factory default settings, so it's key to lock these down before adding this to your network. User access control provides governance on who can access your data and services and what level of access the user has. It also includes having a documented password policy with password recommendations, multi-factor authentication for all user accounts, and implementing least privileged policies, which will still allow your staff to do their work. For malware protection, this control speaks for itself as it covers the AB malware protection on an employee's workstation, including mobile devices. All protection should be fully up to date with scans configured. And one of the supported processes is only using apps that are application signed and on your business's approved software list. Finally, to patch management, which covers operating system and firmware updates. It's important that any device within the business has auto updates applied, if not a procedure for manually updating the device. Sometimes updates do cause issues with certain software, and it's recommended to have sandbox environments for patch testing for deploying updates to the live environment. MySoft UK Security Department worked alongside the Government Digital Service and National Cyber Security Centre to create a recommended MySoft 365 framework for their customers. This framework uses MySoft's built-in security tools and options to create a strong foundation to minimise cyber attacks and are recommended for businesses to follow. Some of these include using the Microsoft 365 Defender portal, which can provide compliance and security recommendations on your client device environment. Once implemented, this will increase the Microsoft Secure Score. Implement a global MFA policy with conditional access rules to follow lockdown sign-ins using Azure AD. Managing the patch management of devices using Intune's update rings. Using Microsoft Defender for all endpoints including email accounts and cloud applications, and deploying a zero trust policy across your state using a number of Microsoft security tools. With the rise of remote working, access from an uncontrolled network is a high security risk, and measures should be taken to mitigate this risk. I will now pass you on to my colleague David, who will expand on some of these recommendations and additional security features that can be deployed using the Microsoft toolset. Good morning, everyone. My name is David Sutherland. I'm a senior cloud engineer here at Bridgel, and I'd like to take a bit of time to discuss some of the advanced features available to you within Microsoft 365, Office 365, and the Enterprise Mobility and Security Portfolio. If you do have any questions, feel free to pop them in the chat. We'll do our best to get to them. So starting with an overview of the advanced security features, in this slide, we've broken down the advanced suite of security features <coughs> into four critical areas and how they can help us protect our organizations. So identity and access management. The features listed in this section are designed to protect the accounts of the users and their ability to access your organizational data and settings. Tools such as Azure AD Identity Protection and Microsoft Defender for Identity are designed to use Microsoft's insights into account behaviours within your environment to identify regular irregularities and risks. Now, an example of this would be what we call atypical travel, where two users, two sign-ins from one user are detected in a short space of time, one from Glasgow and one from, say, Australia. Now, this 
the Microsoft represents a physical impossibility for you to be in those two places so close together. So that would be flagged as a potential threat and highlighted to you. Technologies such as Windows Hello and Windows Credential Guard are designed to remove reliance on user passwords to gain access to devices and data. Instead, utilizing such tools as user biometrics or access pins in combination with built-in hardware on the device for authentication. Privileged identity management allows you to utilize a principle of least privilege within your 365 environment, effectively granting access to protected resources and settings on an ad hoc basis uh, ad hoc basis using a request based system for a limited period of time. This is as opposed to having a user with permanently elevated access rights and represents uh, a method of reducing your security risk here. Now, threat protection features are designed to protect your organization against complex cyber attacks. And such an attack can take many forms, including the use of malware, phishing and password cracking to compromise your user systems for the purposes of accessing, stealing or destroying your company held data. And the tools contained within here are designed by Microsoft to protect your organization at both an endpoint and a cloud based level. Now, I've also mentioned here Microsoft Intune and Windows Autopilot. I'd like to talk about those shortly. Um, so for the time being, I'm going to move on and cover uh, information protection. Now, the concept of Microsoft's information protection tools are that they're designed to help you discover, classify and protect sensitive information within your organization, regardless of whether where it's stored and where it's accessed from. Now, between myself and Craig, we're going to cover a bit more information about those tools shortly. So finally, in this slide, I'd like to cover security management. Now, when we talk about security management, we refer to the ability to view and understand the current security level across your estate at an organization level. Now, <clears throat> I've listed, listed a few of the, in my opinion, important portals here that would help us to do this. Uh, those being the Microsoft 365 Defender portal, the Microsoft Purview portal and the Microsoft Endpoint Manager portal. And we'll talk a bit more about those in the coming slides. So on this slide, I'd like to start with what's available in Azure Active Directory to help secure your organization. Um, first and foremost, most important uh, point for me would be to enable multi-factor authentication within your environment. Now, enabling this can significantly reduce the risk of users' accounts being compromised leading to critical data loss. Multi-factor authentication requires the user or prevent, or presents the user with a secondary confirmation following their password. Now, this can be presented to users in a number of ways, whether it be via text message, phone call, or an authenticator application, which can have a further security layer applied and require user biometrics enabled in order to unlock the application. As part of people management, it's imperative that organizations maintain their user base within Azure Active Directory. Now, when I say that, I'm referring mainly to the process of movers, joiners and leavers. Uh, when a user leaves your company, as a minimum, you should be looking to have their account password reset, the privileges removed and assign and disabled. An active and unmonitored account within your environment represents a possibility for potential and a potential target for hackers to exploit security vulnerability. Moving on, using conditional access within Azure AD, you can create a specific set of conditions and rules that must be met for a user to successfully authenticate uh, with your Azure Active Directory and access your corporate data. Now, some examples of how you, you might be able to do this, you could uh, lock access to your data down to requests only coming from your corporate public IP address from your office or VPN traffic routed through your office. You could mandate that only a company managed device is able to access your data so it can't be accessed on a personal device. Uh, or you could even prevent access from devices that don't have up to date operating system patches installed. Now, these are just a few examples um, within conditional access, but it is possible to be very granular uh, in order to ensure that your data can only be accessed via your desired rules and conditions. 
And lastly for this slide, user access. So Azure Active Directory by nature enables you to collaborate with users from inside your organization uh, with, sorry, with, within your organization and with external users. Now users are able to join groups, invite guests and connect to cloud apps as well as working remotely from the worker personal devices where available. This in longer term can lead to access permissions uh, for users and groups being out of date, no longer relevant or potentially insecure. Now, as an advanced feature within Azure Active Directory, it's possible to schedule and conduct regular access reviews in order to maintain correct group membership information for your users, effectively helping reduce your security risk. Now, moving on to our next slide, I'd like to talk about Microsoft Intune. So for those of you that might not be familiar with Intune, uh, it's a cloud-based endpoint management solution which supports Windows, Mac, Linux, Android, and iOS platforms. Now, it, uh, it gives the ability to manage user access, simplifies app and device management across your devices, and these can include mobile devices, desktop computers, and virtual endpoints. So why Intune? So I've made a, a few short points here as to why I feel it's advantageous to use Intune over other uh, management solutions. So Intune itself is a web-based admin center, meaning that you're able to access it and configure it from anywhere that you are and from any device, as long as you have a web browser on it. It uh, contains a built-in dashboard, giving you a quick ability to view the status of your estate. Um, moving on to the actual endpoints themselves, it gives you the ability to configure policies to control what settings and limitations are applied to your devices, effectively being able to lock them down, uh, removing local admin rights for users. You could also uh, apply settings such as wireless profiles, apply security certificates, uh, configure update policies and schedules uh, for your devices to make sure they're constantly up to date, uh, as well as installing company approved applications. Now another point about Intune, you can also create compliance policies, and these are effectively used to highlight the status of your devices across your environment. So you can set baselines where you're, you want the minimum version of your operating system to be. Uh, you can have a report back on whether or not BitLocker is enabled on your devices, if your endpoint protection is up to date. And in the case of your mobile devices, you can have a report back if the device has been rooted or jailbroken and use that as a compliance breach uh, and highlight that on your dashboard. Now, it's worthwhile noting that uh, Intune is not limited to corporate owned devices. You can also apply policies and settings on a bring your own device. Um, your company data can then be protected on a bring your own device through an app protection policy. Now, this, can fit, this controls how your corporate data is handled. You can configure options where it's it can't be copied and pasted out of the approved application. You can't screenshot it um, and you can't save it to the local device itself. A couple of other points on Intune's advantages. Um, you can register your devices without a need to connect to a local Active Directory. A user can register the device in there, provided you allow them to do so. You can also wipe and reset devices, troubleshooting purposes, and you can remotely track and lock your lost and stolen devices. I'd like to add a couple of points here about integrations to Intune. So Intune supports uh, integration to Defender for Endpoint, which will allow you to automatically enforce your endpoint protection settings, such as your antivirus policies, and BitLocker policies to the devices. The device compliance, which I spoke of earlier, can also be tied to your conditional access. Now this can be used to allow and prevent access to your data depending on the reported status of the device, i.e. if your device doesn't meet, uh, it's not showing as being compliant, you can block that device accessing any of your corporate data and you can set conditions on that based upon your, your compliance policies that we mentioned before. And finally, in this one, your device status can also be viewed and summarized in the Microsoft 365 Defender portal, which I'll expand upon shortly. Now, Speaking of integrations, 
Windows Autopilot is an integrated component of Microsoft Intune as well. So Windows Autopilot is designed to efficiently deploy your Windows devices to your users, minimizing the overhead to your IT departments. Uh, once you have configured your required compliance configuration policies, uh, as well as any update and application policies, what we can effectively do here is follow the flow of the diagram. So <clears throat> say you want to order some new devices, you go to your vendor, whether that be HP, Dell, Lenovo, etc., and say, I want to purchase some new devices and I'm going to enroll them in Windows Autopilot. So once those devices have been built, your vendor will enroll them into your Autopilot setup uh, along with their order number and date that you can view. The devices at this point can then be sent directly to your end user for deployment. And when the user first powers up the device, they'll be prompted for their email address uh, and credentials, which will tie into uh, the autopilot system. The device will then realize that it has been configured with autopilot. It will then deliver the, <coughs> excuse me, your required security settings applications and uh, any restrictions to the user device, at which point it'll be ready for the user to use. Now, uh, there are a couple of other advantages here in that for troubleshooting purposes, you can quickly reset these devices, but once you've reset them, they will always automatically tie back into your autopilot system unless you retire the device and mark it as end of life. So as well as minimizing overheads, for the device deployment. Autopilot also allows you to consistently build devices to your secure predefined standards. It's something that may be particularly useful if you're applying for a Cyber Essentials certification. <clears throat> now, moving on slightly, we referenced the Microsoft 365 Defender portal earlier. I'd like to talk a bit more about that just now. Uh, so the Defender portal, is a new and improved security hub within Defender itself. Uh, it's designed to operate as your single point of glass for security within UT65 tenant. The main purpose of the portal here is to highlight potential for risk and attack, and also to help you mitigate, uh, mitigate these risks as, as quickly as you can. So in order to do this, Defender portal ties into uh, four key areas to display your data here, uh, those being uh, Defender for Office 365, which will pull in and tie uh, in your email security side. Uh, Defender for Endpoint, which will show the status of your user devices endpoints. Defender for Identity, which relates to uh, threats to your user accounts and risks. And Defender for Cloud Apps, which will show the status of your cloud applications here. Now, linking into these services, the portal is able to offer a real-time snapshot of your environment security, uh, along with any recommendations of how you're best placed to improve the current security. Moving on to my next slide here, I'd like to talk a bit about uh, data security and email, and maybe you may get a poll popping up here shortly. Um, now, as my colleague Ken mentioned earlier, uh, over 80% of all cyber attacks these days are related to phishing. So Microsoft Defender for Office 365, um, part of Microsoft Security Suite, is designed to safeguard your organization against malicious threats posed by email messages, uh, links, and collaboration tools. Now, as you can see as a reference point, we've included a couple of well-known third-party email security tools here, just to kind of guide you as to where Defender for Office 365 is placed as a tool for the market. So it's designed to build on the inbuilt 365 Exchange online protection security. And in doing so, it will allow you to configure policies for uh, anti-phishing, uh, which can help with the uh, user and domain impersonization, emails delivered to users. Um, it can provide a degree of automatic remediation here as well and also uh, potential phishing emails. You can also configure specific user safety tips to be displayed at Outlook and Outlook Online. Uh, Anti-spam policies can be configured here, which will allow you to set some advanced quarantine rules um, and define whether or not the these go to user quarantine, admin quarantine, or you can bypass them altogether and have them delivered to users. 
um, and also anti-malware where you configure uh, attachment protection, filtering and blocking, and also that feeds into your quarantine as well. And building on the anti-malware, you also have safe attachments. Now this is a facility uh, that Microsoft provides where attachments or emails are pushed into a sandbox environment and pre-scanned for any potential threats before they are then reattached to the email and delivered to the end user. Um, building on attachments, we also have safe links. Now, any links and URLs within emails delivered to your users uh, are scanned in real time when the user clicks them. The, the experience of the user is brief and momentary. They'll see a couple of seconds and then it'll, it'll forward them onto the URL as long as it's been deemed safe. Um, malicious links, however, are blocked and they're dynamically blocked. Uh, so say a link was delivered to one user, once it's been identified as a threat, that will then be identified as a threat to any further user that receives that link. And one other uh, feature I'd like to highlight in Defender 365 is attack simulation training. Now this will allow an IT admin to effectively simulate a phishing attack for users. You can configure <coughs> what particular type of credentials you're trying to harvest or information, um, and you can send that as a simulation to your user. Now, off the back of that, you will get a report as to if users have clicked links, if they've submitted credentials, and it allows you to build a, a knowledge base and identify training needs. And as part of the simulation training campaign, you can automatically assign uh, training based upon the outcome if a user were to uh, fall foul of the phishing attack simulation. I'd also like to highlight here that unlike the third party tools mentioned, the uh, benefit for Defender for C65 is that it's also capable of protecting against malicious files and links that are contained within SharePoint, OneDrive and Microsoft Teams, uh, as well as the Exchange Online environment itself. Now, at this point, I'd like to pass back to my colleague, Craig, uh, who's going to continue on with uh, some data security for you. Thank you. OK, with this slide, I'll be speaking about uh, data security for Microsoft SharePoint. Uh, last May, Microsoft announced that nearly 8 million new SharePoint sites are created each month. These are active sites and don't include sites for testing, development, etc. But a lot of companies don't realise that without the correct security controls, SharePoint is a primary target for all kinds of malware and data loss. It is key to implement security within this environment. And we recommend some of the slides, sorry, some of the controls shown in this slide. Access control by identifying the sensitive data and using Azure AD to lock down access to these files and folders. Turning off inheritance would be the first step to control access to stop any unapproved accounts accessing this data. <clears throat> Excuse me. Another step is IP based sessions to block or limit access on unmanaged devices or networks. Uh, proactive monitoring, which is creating alerts for accessing and working with sensitive data. In addition to this, performing weekly security, security audits are recommended, especially if staff are changing rules internally. This will make sure they have the correct access to the correct data. And finally, data loss prevention policies. This involves creating DLP policies to identify sensitive documents and restrict them from being shared. This is also discussed later within this presentation. In this slide, we've highlighted the most common steps in deploying a successful data loss prevention plan. Every business should take the time to design a policy that suits their needs, which doesn't impact business productivity, but still ensures data is protected. Microsoft recommends securing your data by implementing a defense in depth strategy which can be fully managed within the Microsoft Purview security toolset. This includes identifying the data landscape, which is understanding how your sensitive data is used, where it lives, and how it's accessed. Protecting sensitive data. Data needs protected both at rest and in transit. This requires creating protection policies to keep data safe by labeling and classifying your data, so you can see how it is accessed, stored, and shared. Managing risks. Internal risk accounted for almost 35% of unauthorised access breaches during the third quarter in 2022, including data leakage, compliance violations, and intellectual property theft. The best approach to addressing insider risk is a holistic approach, 
bring together the right people, processes, training and tools. Preventing data loss. This includes unauthorised use of data. It is critical to ensure the correct access controls are in place with policies enabled to prevent actions like mistakenly saving, storing or printing sensitive data. And finally, governing the data lifecycle. Proactive data governance is the key to better data security. This will ensure data is responsibly accessible to the user. Microsoft Purview is the latest addition to Microsoft security portfolio. It combines the former Azure Purview and Microsoft 365 compliance solutions into a single pane of glass with a focus on risk and compliance solutions from security and unified data governance from data and AI. This tool helps you manage your on-premises, multi-cloud and SaaS data. It consists of three components, data map, data catalog and data insights. Data map provides a starting point for data discovery and effective data governance. It's a cloud native pass service that captures metadata about enterprise data present in analytics and operation systems, both on-premises and cloud. This information is then used within the Purview Data Catalog and Purview Data Insights as a unified experience within the Microsoft Purview Portal. Data Catalog is a detailed visual of your data estate. This catalog makes data sources easily discoverable and understandable. Once a search is entered, Purview returns a list of data assets match the relevant keywords, collections and classifications you've selected. And finally, Data Insights. This is a single window into your data assets, scans, glossary, classifications and sensitivity labeling. It gives you the ability to see audit trails of your data, categorised by sensitivity and business relevance. Regarding sensitive information, it's a simplified compliance risk assessment across all your operational and transactional data sources. Microsoft Purview Security Toolset can assist with providing a structured approach to improving your data compliance stands, reflected in a single compliance score, discovering what data you have, where it's located and how it's been used, can manage your data to meet compliance requirements such as GDPR, remove the manual task of governing your data to reduce risk as it allows you to control who can see and use your data, automatically classify data so you can easily find where this data is stored in an estate, implement protection with the proper access controls and policies to prevent incorrect use of sensitive data. Just last week, Microsoft announced the release of adaptive protection, which will save security teams valuable time whilst ensuring data security. It uses insider risk management machine learning and can understand how users use the data and identify activities that may, be, may result in a security incident. Once high risk users are detected, a strict DLP policy with strong data protection controls can be automatically enforced to reduce the impact of potential security incidents early on. The risk levels for adaptive protection update dynamically based on the user's risk factors. So when users' data security risks increase or decrease, their risk levels will be just adjusted, sorry, adjusted accordingly. We've added a link to the chat to show adaptive protection in action, and there are links to Microsoft's interactive, interactive guides for information protection, and data lifecycle management and also inside the risk management. Microsoft operate a shared responsibility model with the uptime of the global infrastructure being a key obligation. This means they'll provide the hosting of the data, but it's your responsibility in controlling access to the data and how it's backed up. If any cloud data is deleted, Microsoft don't guarantee complete and fast restores, and that's why you recommend a backup procedure as applied to the cloud environment being used. This can be a Microsoft provided service like OneDrive for Business or a third party product like Veeam Backup for 365. OneDrive for Business can be used to back up your user profile, including documents, images, music, and other important files to its cloud based storage. It can also sync SharePoint libraries for offline backups. Most plans include five terabytes of storage per user, with some plans having unlimited storage. However, we recommend Veeam Backup for 365 for full email and SharePoint data protection from accidental deletion, security threats and retention policy gaps. For example, we recently had an issue with one of our clients where data within Microsoft SharePoint had been deleted. With Microsoft SharePoint, items are retained for 93 days from the time the item is deleted from the original location. In this case, the item couldn't be restored. But as our client had Veeam Backup 365 protected the environment, we could instantly restore the client's data 
before the correct timestamps and security settings to the original location. Also, another key feature of this software is that it can provide efficient e-discovery of the items backed up. This can assist with any legal and compliance requirements within your business. Okay, and I'll pass you over to Ken, who'll discuss some of the features. Thanks, Greg. Thanks, David. So the tools and features we've discussed today are available in several subscription packages shown here. The Office 365 Enterprise E5 package includes threat protection, which is effectively Microsoft Defender for Office 365 and covers information protection and advanced compliance tools. The Enterprise Mobility and Security Suite is an enterprise security and mobility platform that helps you safeguard and govern applications, data, devices, and users. And the Microsoft 365 packages combine the productivity services of the Office 365 business and enterprise plans with the addition of the Enterprise Mobility and Security Platform and Windows 10 and 11 operating systems. Bridgehall has created a detailed guide discussing all the M365 license and options, subscriptions, features and tools. It's available on our website and we can provide a link on the, on the Teams chat for you today. We'll finish the presentation with a quick look at some of our customers we've helped implement these solutions for. The Security Industry Authority are a division of the UK Home Office. They were migrated in the middle of COVID throughout 2020. The SIA did a business case to compare licensing costs and found it cheaper to opt for M365 E5, replacing their existing enterprise agreement, antivirus protection, email and web filters and other third party tools. Their M365 platform was configured in accordance with the Microsoft Security and NCSC framework document. And this defines a good, better and best approach to using the tools and features available. Configuration of the M365 platform and operational processes depending on the level of licensing that you have available, whether it be E3 or E5, etc. The SIA moved to M365 with a phased approach, but started with security first. Azure AD premium for conditional access policies was set up in tune with policies for user laptops and mobile devices and a full document classification for data information protection. These were all established before deployment of the M365 Office applications, Exchange for email, SharePoint for data, and then we finished with Teams for voice calls and collaboration. The Scottish National Investment Bank, they also opted for the M365 E5 subscription with the platform configured using NCSC framework best approach. Their implementation include the, included the rollout, the rollout of new laptops for all staff. And these came direct from the manufacturer with autopilot settings pre-configured, which allowed us to ship the, the devices direct to the employees' homes during COVID, and they were set up automatically without any IT input. The bank makes extensive use of conditional access policies, blocking use of personal devices, ensuring corporate data stays on corporate devices. So that's the end of our presentation today. I'd like to invite any any more questions. I see we've been getting some already through the through the chat. Is there any key questions that have come up, David or Craig, that you've you've spotted just now? Yeah, Jason's asking about the conditional access. That if a device like came onto your network that was uh, tagged as, as non-compliant on on Intune. Yeah, so the conditional access itself wouldn't affect. Your local area network, for instance, if you were on on premise, you, you, your conditional access would only be blocking or restricting 
access to the to the cloud resources, whether it be Exchange Online, SharePoint Online, they can be configured as a whole or they can be configured individually. Um, so, yeah, it's um, you know it's it's endlessly um, configurable for for your requirements effectively. I think we had a question earlier on about about licensing and um, I think the key is that they're asking about the Intune license itself. Um, all of the components are, are are available on single license and so you can license just Defender or you can license just Intune, but the best or by far the best way to, to do this is is through a package and through a um, one of the suites, whether it be Enterprise Mobility Suite or the M365 um, suite of, of, of um tools and features and um, that, that's normally the most cost of cost effective way to to achieve what you need i think jason had a uh, oh no there's another question there sorry ken i think jason had uh, raised his hand as well in the chat um is there a way of removing BitLocker recovery keys other than deleting the machine and re-add? Um, I'll refer that to David. David, BitLocker recovery keys in in um, Intune. So with the ones that are <coughs> tagged into uh, Azure AD as opposed to your on-premise, it is possible to cycle the BitLocker keys to change them as opposed to having to delete and remove them. Um, there is an option there for that on your systems, but it does rely on them being <clears throat> stored in Azure Active Directory as opposed to on-prem for you to do that. Did you say someone had their, their hand up, Zobash? Was it? Yeah, I think uh, Jason had um, his hand up in the chat. I don't know whether it was regarding the last Question. Um, I think we touched on I that. Think we touched it, yeah, yeah, I think we touched it. Yeah, I think we. Yeah, I think we tried to answer that one already. Okay. I think that's if there's no more questions, I think we could we could wrap up. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, I don't think that's. Oh wait, there was another. There's another uh, comment from Jason in the chat. He says no. It only seems may, maybe Jason. If we want to take this offline and go into a bit more detail, but um, yeah, I mean the key is is that you you know the target is here to protect your data, um, and you know the you, you there is the ability, for instance, to to limit the amount of data that, um, or the, the amount of access to an app. So, for instance, you could say on on user devices or users personal devices, they could access um, Outlook Web Access, for instance, the, the web version of the um, of Exchange, you know, to, to access emails and calendars. Um, however, because it was a personal device, you've got the ability to actually restrict users from downloading any data off of the the web access or or reading attachments or so, so that you're effectively limiting the functionality of of the tool set because it's not a corporate device so it it is i wouldn't say endlessly configurable but it, it is there are so many different settings and configurations and scenarios that that can be established but i, I would I would look at it from the primary perspective of um, protecting your data um, and not not the service itself. Okay, well, that's that's perfect. That sounds good. Um, I think we'll probably wrap up here. I'm quite aware that other people might have other meetings and things on as well. So, um, yeah, if there's any other questions, obviously we will send a follow up 
um, with all the details and we, you can obviously still get in touch with us if there are any questions you think of later on. Um, just wanted to say a huge thank you to Ken, Craig and David for the presentation today. Um, we really hope that you found it useful. Um, as I said, we will be sending you a follow up shortly. Um, so in the meantime, if you do have anything that comes up, I know what it's always like, you know, you've, after the session's over, then you think about 50 questions you want you could have asked. So um, yeah, please do do get in touch with us. But um, yeah, thank you so much again for joining us and we hope to see you at a future virtual event. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everyone. No, thanks, everyone. Bye.